The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10438 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the Housing Scotland Bill. I would invite all of the members who wish to participate in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Margaret Burgess to speak to and move the motion. Minister, around 10 minutes, but at this stage we do have some time for interventions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'll start uh, this debate by thanking everyone who contributed to the development of the Housing Bill, including members of all parties and stakeholders from across all sectors of housing. And I'm grateful to those stakeholders for their considered thoughts on the Bill, both while the Government was shaping its policy and during Parliament's consideration of the Bill. And I thank the members of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill and I was pleased to bring forward a number of amendments at Stage 2 in response to the Committee's recommendations. I believe the broad consensus for the policies in the Bill reflects our commitment to working with stakeholders on its provisions. Following enactment, we will continue that dialogue as we, as we draft guidance and take forward implementation. The Scottish Government published its strategy for housing homes for the, fit for the first 21st century in February 2011, and it included a number of measures that required legislation, and this bill fulfils that commitment. It will safeguard the interests of consumers, support improvements to the quality of housing, and secure better outcomes for communities. It introduces greater flexibility for social landlords to manage their houses, and by ending right to buy, it provides social landlords with more certainty in planning to invest in those houses as well as investing in new homes. The committee and stakeholders had concerns that a three-year period was too long and, and, reduced this, and I reduced this to two years. But I believe this balances the need to stop social housing being sold at discount as soon as reasonable possible while ensuring that those who have the right to buy and are, and are able to exercise it have a reasonable opportunity to do so. Two years gives them time to consider their options carefully and seek reputable financial advice without being rushed into a decision. Ending right to buy sits alongside this government's target to deliver 30,000 new affordable homes in the five years of this parliament. And by the 31st of March 2014, we had already delivered 19,903 affordable homes 14,294 of these for social rent, 71% of our social rent target. We are therefore in track to meet that 30,000 target and have now committed £1.7 billion in the five years of this Parliament to deliver these vital homes. And yesterday, the First Minister announced that we'd reach a billion pound spend which is a substantial investment in housing. And not only is it an investment in housing, that spend uh, creates, sustains 8,000 jobs in each year of that investment. But the James Kelly. Thank the Minister for taking uh, an intervention. Do, does the Minister realise she's announcing a, a billion pound spend, quoting the First Minister from yesterday. Do you recognise the fact that there's been a 29% cut in the housing budget, and as a result of that, we've seen the lowest, the lowest number uh, of completions since 1947, and we see the effect of that in our own constituencies with a growing waiting list, and that's the effect, that's the effect of the cuts in the budget. Uh, what, what I recognise is that this Scottish Government is investing more and building more social houses than any previous administration in this party, more council houses and more houses by registered social landlords. And that's simply a fact. That's a fact. It can't be disputed. So we're doing that at the same time we're investing in affordable houses, uh, in mid-market rent. Order, please. We Order are committed to housing in this country. We are still, there are more houses per head of population being built in Scotland than there are in the rest of the UK. And we are building the houses, no matter what James Kelly is trying to say, we are outperforming any other place in the UK in building houses. But we we'll also have to look at the private rented sector, which has grown significantly in the last 10 years. And that's why this government consulted on and published the first private rented sector strategy for Scotland. This bill introduces measures that will strengthen the regulation of the sector. 
It gives local authorities increased powers to tackle poor conditions through third-party reporting to the private rented housing tribunal and the power to inspect a property. It gives local authorities new discretionary powers to tackle mm. disrepair in the owner-occupied sector. It establishes a housing tribunal to deal with the private rented sector cases. And it I'll take an James Kelly. Can I just ask the Minister, what does the bill offer to tenants in the private sector that are facing, facing rent rises of nearly 20 per cent? What, what's your answer to those tenants? I think what Members, I remember say, to speak through the chair, please, Minister. I, I think what I would say to, to James Kelly is that this government, and what I'm saying is we are absolutely committed to those that rent in the private sector. We introduced the first private sector strategy for Scotland. We are regulation of the, the landlord registration scheme. We're enforcing, making sure that's been enforced. We're also going to regulate the letting agency industry, ensuring that tenants get a fair deal. We're already looking at tenancy regime, and I'll talk about that later in my speech. We were thinking about that and looking at that long before James Kelly ever talked about it. All of these measures we have developed through consultation with stakeholders, and I'm clear that it will help to ensure there are good standards across the private rented sector. There's broad consensus for the approach to regulating letting agents, and I believe that the framework has been strengthened during the scrutiny of the bill. The Scottish Government will continue to work closely with stakeholders and others to develop the code of practice and to ensure that it delivers a robust regime. And I hope that answers Patrick Harvey's point from earlier, that when we're looking at the code of practice, it will be a very wide consultation and, of course, not just with the letting agency industry. Members from all parties have been keen to understand what the code will cover, so it's right that it should come back to Parliament for its consideration and agreement before being in implemented. Measures to improve standards in the sector have been strongly supported. The new requirements on landlords to have regular electrical safety checks and install carbon monoxide detectors brought forward by Bob Doris and Jim Eady have been welcomed by landlord and tenant organisations alike. And there are those in the chamber who have been critical, saying that the bill doesn't go far enough, that it should include measures on energy efficiency, increasing security to tenure and capping rent increases. The Scottish Government is taking forward work to develop energy efficiency standards for the private rented sector and will consult on those in 2015. The consultation will invite views on what those standards should be, as well as the timescale for introducing those standards. It is right that we, can we take time to work with stakeholders to identify the right proposals and consult fully on those. The Independent Private Tenancy Review Group published its report last month. I have accepted its recommendation for a new single private tenancy that would cover all future lets in the sector. We will develop detailed proposals for this and will consult on those in the autumn. And these measures deal with issues that were identified by the Private Rented Sector Strategy Group and the Government's consultation on its draft strategy. That group, made up of stakeholders from across the sector, did not identify issues with rent levels or rent increases. James Kelly's proposals to cap rent increases would require major legislative change, and any such change should be based on a clear understanding of the nature and scale of the problem and what the options are for addressing it, so that we can be sure that it has a positive outcome and avoids un any unintended cons consequences. And that should be done through discussion, consultation and careful drafting of provisions if required not by an amendment that gives ministers very broad powers and sets unrealistic timescales for introduction. We will be looking at that in our consultation on the tenancy regime in, in August in the autumn. And a crucial factor in driving up rents in the private rented sector is limited supply. And the government is working with a range of partners to deliver homes for mid-market rent through initiatives such as the National Housing Trust, and that's on track to deliver over 2,000 much-needed new homes in communities across Scotland. We're also supporting Homes for Scotland in its work to attract new institutional investment into the sector by funding a dedicated Scottish private rented sector champion. They will be tasked with bringing developers and potential funders together to deliver new high-quality homes in the sector. And I'm not complacent, and as I said earlier and during the amendments, the consultation on a new single tenancy will also explore issues relating to rent levels in the private, sectors, the private sector. The bill also introduces 
new, new uh, rights for mobile home homes, particularly many of them who are elderly people who live permanently in sites across Scotland, and they'll benefit from the provisions in this bill that update legislation dating from the 1960s. These measures will ensure that site owners are fit and proper persons and strengthen local authority licensing powers so that they can target those who are not complying with the law. The Housing Bill brings together a wide-ranging package of measures which the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee concluded will make improvements across the social, private rented and owner-occupied sectors. And those measures were developed in consultation with stakeholders and have been strengthened by the scrutiny of this Parliament. And I commend the, to them, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Housing Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. I now call uh, Mary Fee, who will be followed by Alex Johnson. Can I just point out at this stage, we have got a little time in hand, so I'll be as flexible as I can. Mary Fee, seven minutes or a wee bit upwards. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on the Housing Bill. And I can confirm that Scottish Labour support the aims of the Bill and welcome many of the measures that it brings to the housing sector. There can be no denying that housing in Scotland faces some significant and complex challenges. And everyone in the Chamber, I'm sure, will agree that we want a strong and growing housing sector. And while we are supportive of the principles of this bill, we feel it's a missed opportunity, and I will expand on that as I progress. This is the eighth year that this administration has been in control of Scotland's housing sector, and we are now about to pass the second housing bill. In the past eight years, the Scottish Government has failed to make housing a priority. Over 150,000 people are on waiting lists in Scotland, Ma many of those in houses that are unsuitably small, in poor condition, and many in the private rented sector are paying far more than they can afford. House building is at its lowest level since the end of World War II, with fewer than 115,000 homes completed for the last few years. However, we can hardly be shocked at that figure when the capital housing budget was cut by 29% between 2008-9 and 2011-12. Audit Scotland have estimated that Scotland will need half a million new homes over the next 25 years to meet demand. And in the period from 2001 to 2006, there were 144,749 home completions under Labour, with a further 112,319 home completions between 2007 and 2012 under the SNP. And it can be easy for both sides to assign blame, but it doesn't change the fact that not enough houses have been built. And when key stakeholders across... Yes? Maureen Watt. I thank the member for giving way. Uh, when will she point out that the decline has been due to decline in the private house building sector, but not in the public sector? Mary Fee. There is a decline across housing in, in, in general in Scotland, and I would just like to remind, I would like to remind the member mm -hmm. that housing has devolved. It is this government's responsibility. The budget has been cut and we are facing a shortfall of 160,000 homes. And I have carefully read the white paper, and I would be grateful, I would be grateful if a member could point out to me on which page in the white paper it tells us how much more you will invest in housing to make it right and better when we are independent. No answer. No, no answer. No answer. No answer. No answer. Well, it is, it is relevant. Um, can, I, can I just make a little progress? When key stakeholders across the sector are saying housing in Scotland is in crisis, we have to listen to them. This housing bill... Ms Bailey and Ms Sturgeon, you're at it again. I would again. like to progress. One minute, Ms Fee. You're at it again. Will the two of you just behave yourself? Mary Fee... Thank you. The Housing Bill was an opportunity to take control of this crisis and start tackling the challenges that we face. 
We would have liked to have seen more progressive parts included and are, disappointing that our, are disappointed our amendments to create sustainable communities, cap yearly rent rises and ensure security for tenants in the private sector did not gain support. The abolition of the right to buy has been long overdue and needed to protect social housing and we welcome this measure in the Bill. However, we would have preferred that in line with the recommendation from the committee and the majority of those who gave evidence for the period to abolish the right to buy to be one year from the date of royal assent. Protecting social housing does not stop ending right to buy. Ensuring everyone has a right to social housing that is suitable for their needs remains a priority for Scottish Labour. That is why we wanted the amendment on sustainable communities. This way we can consider sustainability by matching tenants to homes and hopefully build long-lasting communities. Living in sustainable communities benefits everyone. Our local authorities and housing associations working with community groups know best what their community needs and working to make sure people can sustain their tenancy and tackle antisocial behaviour is a priority for Labour. Part three of the bill in the transfer of power to the first tier tribunal is a practical move. Sheriff courts across Scotland are struggling to support criminal justice proceedings and it's a step in the right direction to take housing related issues out of these courts. However, careful monitoring is required to ensure that tribunals remain fair and representative. And on the private rented sector, James Kelly brought forward amendments which would improve the bill um, with his amendments on rent reviews, um, increases and tenancy lengths. Indeed, the SNP's own expert working group on welfare said, in relation to the private rented sector, this means looking at the nature of tenancies, for example, giving tenants in the private sector longer term tenancies than generally exist at present, as well as building into tenancy agreements that rent should increase in line with inflation, but not above. Another feature of the bill is the registration of letting agents. And we need a strong, well-regulated private rented sector with meaningful sanctions that give confidence and security to both tenants and landlords. And I am pleased that the Minister has recognised the merit of my amendments at stage two on triple STs, and I welcomed her own amendment, which ensures that tenants get more information as to why they are being transferred to an SST and what action will be taken in the right of appeal. At stage one and two, concerns raised regarding mobile home site owners, adding additional charges for, for utilities, and again, the Minister took on board my amendment and has herself amended the bill. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I can confirm that Scottish Labour will be supporting the passage of this bill. And as I mentioned earlier, the housing sector in Scotland faces some complex and difficult challenges going forward. And it is disheartening that the bill does not contain any new or radical proposals, but this does highlight the lack of vision on housing from this government. And going forward, Scottish Labour's vision would be for a strong and vibrant housing sector. We would engage with key stakeholders across Scotland to build a policy that makes a real difference with a long-term strategy for rural and urban housing. We would seek to regenerate our town centres and to tackle the empty properties that affect all of Scotland. We would be innovative and have a long-term housing action plan that would actually tackle Scotland's housing crisis head on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fee. I now call on Alex Johnson. Mr. Johnson, five minutes plus. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been an exciting afternoon. I can say that because sitting here at the front uh, dealing with the amendments does allow the time to pass rather more quickly than it does if you're one of the poor unfortunates who find themselves sitting at the back trying to do paperwork and watching the clock. However, uh, it has been an exciting day. I've managed to do a spirited defence of the negative procedure, something which uh, sets me out as a minority in this chamber. And before we finished, I also managed to lead my party into voting against an amendment which was consequential to one we'd accepted earlier in the debate. So it's been an eventful day so far. The, by the way, that was a mistake, presiding officer. The, these things happen. This debate on the motion that the bill, bill be passed is one in which I have to cover a number of key issues. This bill does have some things within it which are of value. The work that has been done to bring the private rented sector 
uh, into a, a position where those who are reputable working within it can uh, succeed in providing housing for those who need it uh, are commendable. The work that has been done with, between the government and the private sector organize, representative organisation, the landlords' organisations themselves, is commendable. This bill also represents the first attempts to bring letting agents into line. And both the, private rent, uh, the landlords and the letting agents are two groups which have an enormous amount to contribute to housing in Scotland in the long term. And it's important that by bringing them into the regulatory structure, we are able to ensure that, as I said before, that the all landlords do what the good landlords have been doing for ages. Because we in Scotland have a, a housing structure which is at the moment creaking at the seams. And I know I've been blamed for defending some of the issues that may have caused that. Yet, there is hope within the discussion we've heard today. I believe that our obsession over social housing masks a fault, a flaw in the market here in Scotland. We seem to take the view that government's responsibility, either at local or national level, is to deal with those who are in the greatest need by the provision of social housing. And implicit in that is the idea that everyone else can look after themselves. Now, I don't believe that's the case, and I believe we th need to think long and hard about the shape of the Scottish housing market. That's why I was particularly delighted to hear in our opening remarks the Minister talking about efforts being made by the government now to bring developers and investors together so that they can go on and build affordable houses in Scotland. I believe that the greatest pressure on our social housing uh, number of uh, houses today is the fact that there is no process by which those who are in social housing can move up the ladder. And the way that we can provide the next rung for the, in that ladder is to take the opportunities of investment that exist, and I know they exist, to build affordable housing for mid-market rent in large quantities. The reason why we have such demand on the private rented sector today is our failure to provide some alternative in the centre of the housing market. And I believe that what I've heard from the Minister today indicates that we may get more effort on the part of the government to achieve what can be achieved through private or institutional investment through developers who are in a position to build these homes and relieve the pressure in the market. Looking back once again at elements of this bill, there are positives also in the provision or, or of a move to first-tier tribunals in dispute resolution. Taking evidence uh, for, on the bill, it was obvious that there is an appetite for that. In fact, there was a, a, the, those who saw the opportunities offered by introducing that for the private rented sector all, also wanted to extend it to the social rented sector. The Minister has spoken about that in previous debates uh, and I think we can take heart from the fact that there is a, a, a view in government that if the tribunals are a success in their current proposed form, then the opportunity will be taken in future to look at extending the range of these tribunals so that we can get a, a more effective use of their powers. There are things, however, that I would wish to have seen in this bill that are not. The changes to allocations policy, which were in the original draft of the bill that would have allowed age to be taken into uh, account in allocations, was removed by the Minister herself at stage two. I tried to put it back in today, but of course that attempt was rejected. I think we do have problems in terms of allocation policy which we need to address. And I saw the inclusion of age as a, a criteria which could be taken into account as a small first step to dealing with some of these problems that we need to address. The failure of the government to press on with the results of its consultation in that area, I believe, is a weakness in the bill. 
Another area which was contained in that original consultation, but yet never saw the light of day in the public bill when it was published, was the concept of starter or initial tenancies. I pro proposed a detailed amendment at stage two, which was rejected. What I would have liked to have seen in this bill is something which would have given us a specific tenancy which could be granted to those who perhaps have the greatest difficulties uh, and require those who provided tenancies to provide the necessary support to individuals. If either, you could bring your remarks to a close. Uh, oh, sorry, I was, I was still in time, presiding officer. I will bring it to a close. The, the key thing that I have to say about this bill relates to right to buy. And I understand what I will have the opportunity to close on behalf of my party, so I will leave that part of my speech until later. Thank you, Mr Johnson, and I do appreciate your efforts. Um, we move to the open debate. Um, at the moment, I can offer the uh, opening uh, debate speakers five minutes each instead of four. Jim Eady, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to take part in this stage three debate on the Housing Scotland Bill. I spoke in the stage one debate and welcomed the general principles of the bill, particularly in, in relation to the abolition of the right to buy, which will result in over 15,000 homes in the social rented sector being retained over the coming decade. And we do need to remember that the right to buy led to a significant reduction in the number of houses that were available for rent. Over the years since it was introduced, it has greatly diminished the amount of housing stock of good quality which was available to, for rent for families across Scotland. We have a duty to provide homes of good quality for all families, including those who cannot afford to buy. And the abolition of the right to buy will ensure that we will no longer have a situation where uh, better properties in the more desirable areas will be sold off, reducing uh, the amount of um, available homes for social rent. The abolition of the right to buy is therefore long overdue, which is why I believe it has been widely welcomed across Scotland. This will enhance social housing and it will protect the investment made in social housing. And I want to nail the lie that this government's record is anything other than a good one. This government is outperforming the previous Labour Liberal Democrat administration's record on council house building since 2007-8. 4,618 new council homes have been completed, compared to only six under the previous administration. Now, in fairness to James Kelly, uh, whenever this issue has been raised in the chamber uh, in the past, he has always pointed to the fact uh, that that statistic ignores the number of housing association homes completed. But here, the record uh, of this government is also uh, impressive. For 30,292 housing association homes have been completed since 2007-8, a rise of 12% compared to the previous 27,000 homes completed uh, under the Labour Liberal Democrat administration. Now, I believe that the bill um, before us is um, one that has been greatly enhanced and strengthened uh, by the uh, the, um, the improvements uh, that we have seen during the passage of the legislation. And we've seen this in a number of key areas where the government has worked with key stakeholders and MSPs across the chamber to further strengthen the bill. And the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Margaret Burgess, I believe deserves credit for the positive way in which she has entered into a constructive dialogue on a range of issues. She has been willing to listen to and reflect on the arguments which have been presented to her. And the bill, as I say, is now better as a consequence of the approach she has taken. I am particularly grateful to the Minister for meeting with me and my colleague Alec Rowley to discuss the issue of temporary accommodation for homeless families. We were both concerned as a result of representations we had received from Shelter Scotland that while the number of homeless families being placed in temporary bed and breakfast accommodation had reduced significantly since changes to legislation were introduced in 2004, there were still a number of families, particularly women and pregnant, uh, pregnant women and uh, uh, children being placed by some local authorities, by no means all, in accommodation which, quite frankly, was not suitable for human habitation and unacceptable in a civilised society. 
Now, the outcome of our discussions is that the Government will now amend the Homeless Persons Unsuitable Accommodation Order 2004 to include a reference to wind and water tight. The amended order will provide further clarity to local councils regarding their provision of temporary accommodation. All people, regardless of what type of accommodation they find themselves in, have a right to enjoy their lives in comfort, safety and dignity. And I now look forward to the amended regulation coming into force by the end of this year to achieve just that. I very much welcome the progress that has been possible uh, during the passage of the bill. I'm grateful uh, to Alec Rowley for his support and to Shelter Scotland for their expertise on this issue. I was also grateful for the opportunity to meet with the Minister along with Sarah Boyack to discuss a number of issues on behalf of the City of Edinburgh Council. And as a result of that meeting, uh, the Government brought forward further changes which will allow local authorities to, to determine a repayment period of between 5 and 30 years and provide a right of appeal for any person who is aggrieved by the period of the charge in relation to the recovery of costs under a repayment charge. The final area where I believe progress has been made is that of making carbon monoxide detectors mandatory in the private rented sector. Again, I am pleased to have worked with Shelter Scotland uh, to bring about this change and I am glad that this Parliament has acted to address this issue so that all private tenants can feel safe from the threat of this so-called silent killer. Thank you, Mr Reedy. Malcolm Chisholm, followed by Jim Hume. Uh, officer, in the um, stage um, one debate, I, I welcomed much of the bill and said uh, the problem was the issues that were missing uh, from the bill, and I think that's still the uh, situation at the end of uh, stage three. Uh, in between, of course, some amendments have been accepted, and I welcome that, but I regret the several which have been uh, rejected today and which would have been useful. I came at this bill, I suppose, uh, from two points of view. One, because of the problems that constituents bring to me about housing on a regular basis, but secondly, because of the issues highlighted by the City of Edinburgh Council, and Jim Eady referred to that in his speech just now and in the stage one debate. Both he and I raised uh, some of these issues that the Labour SNP Council in Edinburgh had uh, brought to our attention. And although it's true to say that the Council uh, will be pleased that there has been some flexibility around the 30-year uh, repayment period, I think it's uh, fair to say that they will be disappointed that none of the other proposals that they brought forward have been accepted today. The, uh, the issue about uh, maintenance plans, which I thought was a, a very reasonable uh, a proposal from Sarah Boyack, uh, modifying the original position, was rejected uh, by the government. And, of course, all the, uh, the amendments that I brought forward, which were all based uh, on uh, the submission from the Council, uh, were rejected as well. So I don't think the City of Edinburgh Council will be very pleased that their main issues that they highlighted uh, for the bill uh, have not been progressed. But over and above that, as I said, I was very much coming at it from the point of view of constituents, and I'm sure all of us at our surgeries get housing issues uh, on a regular basis. So I'll just pick up on four of those issues that I regularly get asked about. Well, supply is obvious. We all know about issues of housing uh, supply. The abolition of the right to buy, as far as I'm concerned, is not something that I object to, but I think there is a danger that we will overstate uh, its effect on housing supply. It's not the most important uh, measure that uh, can be taken to improve supply of housing in the social rented sector, but I certainly don't object to it, although it would have been better to accept uh, the amendment uh, in, in terms of one year, which Mary Fee uh, moved at committee. The second problem, uh, well, I would just say in relation to supply, the more significant issue in terms of supply is, of course, the Housing Association grant, because the figures are all quoted about the number of houses, social rented houses being built, but the problem is they are on a declining trajectory, and a lot of the kind of half-respectable figures that are presented to us are based on the, the higher HAG levels uh, of, of the early years of the SNP administration. So we are going to have increasing difficulties keeping up the number of social rented homes because of the uh, HAG levels. They were changed slightly uh, by uh, Nicola Sturgeon in the summer, but last summer, but there is still a problem. All the housing associations tell us. The second problem that constituents bring to me, and I'm sure everybody else, is anti-social behaviour. So hopefully the short SST will help there. But again, Mary Fee was quite right, of course, at committee 
to get an amendment passed about uh, more information about those so, so that there are all the safeguards there that we require. It's obviously a very small number of tenants who cause problems, but we all have examples of massive problems being caused by a very small number of people. So I personally welcome the uh, uh, increased availability of the short SST, and hopefully that will make it easier to evict the very small number of people who, unfortunately, do require to be uh, evicted um, because of their behaviour. But again, it would have been better around antisocial behaviour if the Holiday Let's Amendment from Drew Smith had been, uh, been accepted. And I also uh, feel that, in general, we could do more about beefing up the landlord registration system to, in order to get more effective action by landlords in the private sector. But in general, it was the private sector, I think, where um, there were most uh, uh, missing uh, parts, as it were, uh, in the bill. Repairs I've already... Uh, touched on uh, briefly. My own amendment was about common repairs and uh, even Alec Johnson and his colleagues were almost going to support it, which I was very encouraged by, although I don't think they did press the right button at the end of the day on that one. But obviously he and his colleagues were recognising that there is a very big problem here and, and, and people bring it to our attention all the time. And it's a pity my amendment on that wasn't accepted. Um, equally, the electoral safety checks is a step forward, but what about all the existing tenancies? I don't know why the minister didn't uh, take the amendment uh, that I suggested on that. And time's nearly out, but I, obviously one of the most important uh, amendments that was brought forward today, um, possibly the most important one, was James Kelly's on uh, capping rent rises. And again, the minister used the standard response of, oh, well, it's very complicated. You need to bring we need your to do close more work. But, but James Kelly's amendment said bring forward regulations. The work could have been done in the context of the regulations. And it is deeply regrettable that James Kelly's proposal, which is also the proposal from the SNP, Working Group on Welfare was not accepted today. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. Jim Hume, followed by Molly Mott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, welcome the opportunity to participate in this evening's uh, debate. It's a, an important bill and a, one that I hope will begin to make the private rented sector more fit for purpose. This sector has experienced extraordinary growth over the past decade, with over 300,000 households now renting privately. So it's little wonder when you consider that since March 2007, over 11,000 properties have been lost from social renting housing stock and the ever-increasing length of waiting lists has driven people towards the private sector. It's long time before we ensure that standards in the sector were improved and I reiterate my support for the regulation of letting agents. Introduction of a tribunal system too and of course inclusion of basic safety measures and the scrapping of right to buy. It is for these reasons uh, I and the Liberal Democrats shall be voting in favour of the bill uh, later on. Since I last had an opportunity to debate the policy measures contained within the government's bill at stage one, there have been a series of interesting amendments which have come to the fore. Many of them are amendments which I genuinely believe enhance the package of measures laid before us by the government. And I'm pleased to see some, though not all of them, uh, now included in the final bill uh, that we'll vote on later. I was disappointed when uh, my amendments were defeated at stage two, particularly my amendment which sought to clarify the position regarding legal representation for tenants participating in the new tribunal process. I felt it was uh, important to reintroduce it at stage three. Uh, and as I said before, following discussions with the Minister and Homeless Action Scotland on this matter, and the Minister's positive words earlier in the proceedings, I'm satisfied that this matter is now in hand and that a satisfactory conclusion has been reached, and I'm grateful to the Minister for her words on that. Uh, like many colleagues, my inbox has been inundated with emails from landlords over the past week and even uh, throughout, the, throughout the process of today. I understand their concerns, and there is no doubt that the majority of landlords are diligent, are fair, and do provide a good level of service. However, there can't be a doubt that a, minor, a minority operate in a predatory fashion and prey upon the vulnerability of some tenants. So I believe that we do need to weed these people out of the sector, and I appreciate the letting associations agree with that. I had some sympathy with the proposal to introduce more secure tenancies. 
Had Amendment 50 passed, a landlord would still have retained the ability to terminate a tenancy after the first six months for antisocial behaviour, accruing of rent arrears, or if the landlord planned to change the use of the property and even use it for his own uh, living accommodation or hers. The amendment afforded the tenants two months' notice to vacate a property, which I believe to be a fair compromise given the upheaval and inconvenience such an event cause causes. However, while I appreciate there are many tenants in the private rented sector struggling with unreasonably high rent increases, I couldn't support uh, Amendment 49, which concerned rent control proposals. This represented such a significant new duty that it could not have been reasonably introduced without the sector having the opportunity to comment upon it first, or, for that matter, have full parliamentary scrutiny. Although I reiterate that the, uh, there are those who struggle with what can be uh, extorbitant rent increases, and the Housing Minister, I think, must reflect upon this and consider how she can assist this in regard to the, the future. Um, at stage two, I, I, did have a, I did have an amendment which I, which I didn't bring forward. I think it was an important one, but one that wasn't uh, supported by any other party. That was one uh, on Section 5 referrals, the fact that the local authorities uh, don't always uh, use Section 5 referrals uh, when they have a homeless uh, family or, or person. I think that uh, would be something that the Minister should maybe uh, consider in, in, in the future to keep an eye on, at least. Uh, we did get the usual uh, uh, SNP rhetoric regarding they built more houses than us and asked more houses than them. Uh, but again, I would like to remind them, uh, as Mary Fee has said, that uh, completions of so socially rented houses are at a lifetime low. And also, again, we have heard uh, the change of language from the 6,000... You need uh, to bring your remarks to a close. Six, thank you. Uh, the 6,000 uh, uh, socially rented houses that were promised, that has been changed to affordable, and we all know there is quite a difference. I welcome the passage of this bill, although still believe I'm it could sorry, have been enhanced further. I'm sorry, your time is up, Mr Hume. Maureen Watt, followed Thank by Alex much. Rowley. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I feel honoured to have had a part in uh, taking this bill uh, through uh, this Parliament, uh, and I look forward to it being passed at decision time this evening. For me, and I'm sure for many in this Parliament and uh, the wider Scottish society, this is landmark legislation. Abolishing the right to buy socially rented housing will have a very positive effect for all those involved in the sector. It will protect and enhance social housing and protect the public investment made in social housing over generations. Since the right to buy was introduced, around 455,000 properties have been taken out of the social sector. This continuing depletion of social housing stock is unsustainable in the face of continued high levels of need for social housing in Scotland. As a representative from Shelter said, the right to buy is like trying to fill a sink without the plug-in. And as David Bookbinder of the Chartered Institute of Housing said, and I paraphrase when he was before the committee, he said, the key benefit is supply, the certainty that abolishing, abolishing right to buy will give local authorities landlord local authorities and housing associations with regard to their strategic and business planning roles and also they will know how much rental income they will have and how much stock they can use for allocations and homelessness and all this will, will be a huge benefit. So by removing right to buy social landlords will have greater confidence to build new homes and 15,500 social houses will be safeguarded for future generations. And we also know that many right-to-buy properties end up in the private rented sector with high rents and <clears throat> um, they also, uh, where, uh, where the, uh, access higher, the access higher benefit claims. So this protection of the social rented stock together with this co government's commitment to building new social housing is welcomed by the sector. There have been 30,292 housing association homes completed since 2007-8, a rise of 7% in the previous seven years, and 100, 
1,324 council houses were completed in 2013-14 alone, a far cry from the six built in the last four years of the Labour Lib Dem administration. <clears throat> so ab abolition of the right to buy, together with other aspects of the bill, will increase the flexibility social landlords have when allocating homes to allow them to better respond to the needs of their communities and make better use of affordable rented housing. I'd like now to turn to, to the uh, legislation regarding mobile homes. I have a number of mobile homes in my constituency and I welcome the strengthening uh, of the protection for those who live in uh, mobile homes. While those in my area who con contacted me regarding uh, this legislation seemed to be content with the way their site was run, I was really surprised how little they know about the existence of organisations representing those who live uh, in park homes. And many homes, as I said, are well run, but there is definite definitive evidence of unscrupulous landlords. So giving local authorities more powers in this area is very welcome. And I look forward to seeing the new model standards for mobile home sites reflecting up-to-date and best practice. Presiding officer, I can't conclude without commenting on the cynical stance of the Labour benches on this bill. Mary Fee said right to buy was long overdue. They had eight years to abolish the right to buy but didn't. James Kelly said he spoke about rents when it was debated in one of their own debates in December. I can't recall that, but why did he not then support Patrick Harvey's amendment, which specifically called for rent controls? Nor did their members on the committee ask any questions of witnesses or stakeholders with whom the committee engaged during its consideration regarding rent controls. Controls. They had to wait till Ed Miliband. They had to wait. Mr. Till Kelly, Ed I'm Miliband sorry. Members in our last gave, 30 seconds. They had to wait until Ed Miliband gave them the lead from down south. So conf their conflating of private and public housing building is typical of them, but they're not believed by the sector and indeed the public, who are much more savvy than Labour give them credit for. Alec Johnson, you need to the, end, Ms. Watt. Yeah, Alec Johnson mentioned the initiatives this government is taking, making sure that private sector and public sector get together to build more houses, and I have great pleasure in supporting the bill. Thank you, Alec Shirley, followed by Patrick Hart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I would begin by thanking the Minister uh, for Meet Mujamidi, myself and Shelter, um, and for the, the positive response that, that we did get. Um, I certainly will be supporting the bill that goes forward today because I think, as, as Sarah Boyack and others have said, there are, there are um, a number of pos positive uh, measures in that bill. Although it would have to be said it would be a fairly dire situation if you brought forward a bill in housing at this particular stage and you didn't address some of the concerns that's out there. And I think it is, it is fair to say that, that in terms of this bill, will it be judged um, is something that, that grasped the issues of the time um, and, and will be remembered for trying to actually tackle the many problems that we have out there. And I think it won't. I think it lacks that level of ambition. Um, what I can say to Margaret uh, Burgess is that the next Labour government elected to this um, Parliament in 2016 will cap rent increases because it is the right thing to do and hiding behind technicalities is not um, an excuse for not doing the, the right thing. I remember in the, the, the 80s and the, the 90s um, the, the poverty trap and the number of people that were, were caught in the poverty trap and unable to therefore progress and, and, and actually take employment and move forward. And the, the excessive rents in the private sector right now um, are creating that, that poverty trap again and are holding many uh, people back being able to try and get into work and take jobs um, that are not necessarily the best paid jobs but the excessive rents in the private sector is a major factor and leads to the, the, the poverty trap that is there. But the truth is, the truth is, and I have said it before, in terms of this bill, and we can have the facts, Mary Fee mentioned the Audit Scotland report, Housing in Scotland, which
which does say that it's amongst the major challenges is a 29 per cent real terms cut in capital housing budgets 2008-9 to 2011-12. They do also acknowledge the number of new homes in the private sector in Scotland is more than halved in recent years and um, the, the pressures with, with an ageing population that are there. But the fact is that there is less rented affordable um, homes now than there was in 2008, 2010 and 2011. Now, as, 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 as was said by, by one of the other speakers, you could, Jim Hume, you can have this, 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 this bun fight where it was us, it was they, and we built more houses than them. But in terms of the people out there that come to mass surgeries, in terms of the people and families that are homeless right now, it really doesn't matter who did what. The fact is we have a major crisis in housing in this country, in every community, the length and breadth of this country, and we're not bringing forward any type of radical proposals here to begin to tackle that. That's why certainly I intend to work with Shelter Scotland over the next year or so to highlight why their policy of 20,000 to 10,000 houses a year is the right policy to begin to tackle some of the issues that are out there. The private sector, I don't believe, can meet the housing crisis that we actually have, and it's a flawed strategy that believes that private rented market can actually tackle the housing crisis we have in this country. I certainly am not ideologically driven by, by public versus private, but in this particular sector, we need to build council housing, we need to build housing association housing, and we need to start to do that and do that at a much greater rate and faster rate and be able to do that now. There are many, many families across Scotland. There are people who are trapped in housing that's not suitable for them. There are, there are families that are massively overcrowded. Every MSP in this parliament, I would have thought, must have a massive caseload of housing must be engaged with the local authorities. And I would make the point also to the Minister, a lot of the council housing that is being built right now is being built by councils up and down the country who have been quite innovative in working with tenants to raise money to actually build houses. So when we're given credit for the houses that are being built, we should give that credit to the local authorities. It's out there. Up, Mr. Rowley. I will conclude, um, presiding officer, by saying, while well, I support this bill, we have a real housing crisis out there. This does not begin to address that crisis, and that's what we need to do. Patrick Harvey. The private rented sector is not just a market. A tenancy agreement is not just a transaction. A home that's available for rent is not just an investment. It's somebody's home. It's where somebody lives. That's its primary function in public policy terms. It's not an investment, it's a home. If the private rented sector wants to continue to grow, wants to manage more of our country's housing stock in the future, it needs to recognise that meeting somebody's housing need is not just about giving them the keys. It's a much more complex job than that, and there are landlords and letting agents who get that. There are landlords and letting agents who understand that their responsibility to a tenant is not just to give them the keys and rake in the cash, but it goes much deeper than that. It may be that we should be seeking to support and cultivate social enterprise to get involved in the private rented sector, the kind of people, the kind of organisations who understand more than just a financial bottom line. It may be that we should be supporting the landlords and letting agents who do understand uh, these issues. But there are many, and I would even suggest most, who don't, who regard their property merely as an investment and are interested not in meeting someone's housing need, but simply in gaining the profit from that investment. And if we continue to see the private rented sector growing in future, and if at the same time economic recovery leads to a period again of rising house prices, rising property values, then we're sowing the seeds of greater inequality in the future. In the long run, we'll continue to see people spending their money on rent, which makes somebody else wealthier. And we'll see that rising inequality. 
I think we need to recognise the responsibility that we have to regulate the private rented sector in terms of the public good, particularly at a time when so many and a growing proportion of our population do not just spend a year or two in the private rented sector while they're a student or while they're moving from one job to another, but increasing proportion who have no other choice for whom we've made no social housing or not enough social housing available and for whom we've allowed economic conditions to make owner occupation unaffordable. There's more to welcome in this bill, not only the abolition of, of the right to buy, uh, but I want to say a few words about it. It's true that the abolition of the right to buy will only deliver its maximum benefit in the context of increased investment in supply. But supply of social housing is not just about how much money is the Scottish Government spending from its budget each year. That's a big part of it, but not the whole of it. I'd encourage members and ministers working on housing issues to look again at the Land Reform Review Group. What it had to say about the affordability and availability of land is crucial if we want to improve the affordability and availability of housing and make it easier for developers, whether in the private sector or the social sector, to build more housing of the type that's needed. And so I'd encourage members to take a look at that. There are three areas where there's work to do which the government has committed to. Security of tenure, a code of practice for letting agents, and I again welcome the clear fixed timescale that's been committed to on that, and energy efficiency. Work to do in the current term uh, of the Scottish Government, opportunities to influence those pieces of work to ensure that they meet the public good and there will be pressure needed. I'll continue to advocate for that pressure, and the ICI committee will have a role to play there as well. I've welcomed the opportunity to engage with that committee over recent weeks and months, and I know that the political atmosphere is charged right now, presiding officer, but frankly, I was dismayed at the level of hostility on display in that committee between the two larger parties. You need to the bring committee your to must understand that they always have a responsibility to hold government to account, not to go into bat for ministers. And large parties, opposition and government, have a responsibility to come together once our atmosphere is less charged in a few months' time and find common ground where they can work together for the common good. Call now, Johnson, Mr. Johnson, for four minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many of us in this chamber come from a diverse range of backgrounds and arrive here with political uh, priorities which differ greatly. Our responsibility is to serve those who put us here, in effect, but to serve the Scottish people as a whole uh, in addition to that. These political principles often mean that individuals within this parliament or parties within it will hold to a philosophy which sets us out on a limb. And nowhere is that more obvious than the Conservative Party's steadfast support for right to buy. The aspiration to own property is something which many people in Scotland have, and we have a responsibility to understand and support where appropriate. The fact that we understand that a house is not just a house, it's a home, is something which we all agree on. It's something that Patrick Harvey said just a few moments ago. But the right to own the house that you live in is an aspiration which I believe is appropriate for Scots to have and one which we should be willing to support. Now, many of us are lucky enough to be in a position to be homeowners through choice. We are able to participate in the marketplace and use the resources available to us in order to buy our home and li then live in it. That's a privilege, a privilege that we should all consider ourselves lucky to have. But should it be a privilege that only the most wealthy within our community have? The right to own your own home is something that we should aspire to supply to everyone in society who is willing to make the sacrifice necessary to achieve that objective. This government appears to understand that. It has gone some way towards introducing shared equity schemes and other opportunities which will allow people to become homeowners. But the problem is, as yet, 
we failed to find an alternative way to achieve that objective in a, on scale compared with right to buy. Many people who used the first right to buy were long-term uh, house, uh, long-term tenants. And, as we've seen from the figures that are available from last year, the vast majority of those who continue to seek to exercise the right to buy are themselves long-term tenants. By ending right to buy, we free up very few houses. But by ending right to buy, we end the opportunity for many to become homeowners. It is an essential part of our responsibility to ensure that we do not miss the opportunity to allow people to aspire to property ownership. The Housing Minister herself has, in recent speeches in this chamber, talked about the need to ensure that people can accrue wealth. And for many, the only opportunity to accrue wealth in a modern society is to borrow against the value of a house and then pay it up over time. We need to make mortgages more affordable. We need to make the opportunity to buy homes more available to those on lower incomes. The Conservative Party, through its support for Right to Buy, has changed the dynamic of Scottish housing. Bring your it has turned us into a country where we are homeowners, not simply home renters. It has turned us into a country where people aspire to improve themselves. There is much that's good in this bill, less so than there was when it was published at stage one. However, as a result of the decision of this government to end right to buy through this bill, at decision time, the Conservatives will vote against it. Thank you, Mr Johnson. James Kelly, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to sum up on this afternoon's debate. Um, the Labour Party, as Mary Fee said in her initial remarks, will be supporting the bill uh, at quarter past seven in, in recognition that uh, some of the progress and some of the issues that are addressed in the bill will improve issues within the housing sector. However, I think both Mary Fee and Alec Rowley gave a very accurate portrayal of some of the issues that are faced within housing in Scotland. You know, the pressures in relation to supply, the consequences of that uh, in terms of lack of affordable housing, uh, the growth in the private sector, uh, and therefore the, the rent levels that, that people uh, are having to uh, endure. Uh, and I think there are wider issues that need to be addressed aside from the issues that are, that are taken in this bill. Uh, I was a bit disappointed in terms of the process of the bill. Uh, I feel that uh, Labour interacted uh, quite positively with, it, with the bill in terms of we submitted an awful lot of amendments. And on the whole, um, many of these were rejected. And it also strikes me that in listening to the, the minister during the course of the debate, you know that we have a plethora of you know consultate, consultations uh, and working groups. Uh, the minister herself said that the, the government's housing strategy was launched in February 2011, and therefore it's taken three years for this bill to to come to fruition. And we seem to have a lot of talking shops, but what people really need on the ground is is they need action. They need you know, practical support. In terms of some of the issues in the bill, clearly the, the headline issue which uh, the government wants to promote is abolishing the right to buy. And uh, we have supported that. It was the right thing to do. Um, however, I don't think the impact of abolishing the right to buy uh, will have the, the grand consequences that the, the, the government uh, envisage. Um, I mean, even on the figures that Maureen Watt quoted, 15,500 over 10 years, that's certainly welcome. But when you've got 155,000 people on um, social housing waiting lists, um, it, the, the impact of that uh, is, is minimal. I think in terms of letting action on letting agents and landlords, um, there's, as a number of speakers have spoken about, there's been a real growth in the private sector private rented sector, 
uh, and therefore there's, there's a real requirement for you know, proper regulation there. Um, you know, there are many responsible uh, letting agents and, and landlords, but you know, there, are, there are a number of unscrupulous individuals, and it's for that reason that you need you know, proper regulation. The, the terms of the bill do improve that, you know, but I think if some of the amendments had, take, had been taken on board, they could have uh, improved it further. And I think similar is true when you look at the, the issue of you know, maintenance plans raised by Sarah Boyack uh, and also uh, electrical uh, safety. I think they, those, those issues could have been strengthened. Uh, clearly, I was disappointed that the government did not take on board my uh, amendments in terms of uh, trying to control rent increases and also introducing longer and more stable tenancies. What did disappoint me particularly about it was that from stage two to stage three, uh, I changed the amendments to give more time. Um, I was really looking for the government to you know, lay regulations before Parliament by April 2015, um, giving nearly 10 months to, to work up proposals. Um, and I thought that was, that was quite a reasonable way forward. And you know, to merely suggest that you know, it was too onerous or too difficult to do, uh, I don't think it was a satisfactory response. I think, you know, in, in kind of drawing to a close, uh, in these debates there's always an, a lot of trade in a statistics to, to back up your argument, argument, and I do that myself, I acknowledge. But in terms of housing, in a lot of ways I don't need to look at the statistics. Um, I can look at the area that I grew up in, the area that I'm lucky enough to represent and that I still stay. And I go around there and I see people that come to my surgeries almost on a weekly basis who are staying in overcrowded accommodation and they can't get, you know, adequate, they can't get access to adequate housing. Um, I see houses that have been you know, in that constituency since before I was born that are beginning to you know, fall into disrepair um, and people still, still stay on them. So we have real issues about people trying to get on the, the housing ladder, about people getting access to social housing, but people staying in accommodation that is in Can you start bringing your remarks to a close? And therefore, in bringing my remarks to a close, a close presiding officer, the real challenge for this government and for all political parties is to come up with a plan for housing that addresses the supply issues, that does something for the people on the ground that don't stay in quality accommodation and that are struggling to find a house. Because ultimately, there is a responsibility on all of us to try and improve the lives of our constituents and people throughout Scotland. And that's what we should bear in mind when bringing forward legislation and also plans for housing in Scotland. Now, I call Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate. Minister, you've got your eight minutes. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think the debate has, in some ways, we've had a lot of uh, consensus in some areas throughout the debate, and clearly there'll be areas that we, we still disagree on. But I, I do want to reiterate uh, what I said earlier, that I very much appreciate um, the stakeholder support we've had for this. And I would say to James Kelly, it's not about talking shops. We are talking to our stakeholders and listening to our stakeholders and worked up the bill with, in consultation with them and along with them. And that's why this bill has so much stakeholder support for many of the, the, the areas that we're introducing in it. And I think that that's an important thing to say. I also, I'll take one James minute. Kelly. Sir, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. In all these discussions with stakeholders, well, the issues around excessive rent levels and the length of security of tenure were they raised with you? Minister. What I said, and I said earlier when I was moving the amendments is that during these discussions, rent levels was not raised with us other than by Patrick Harvey. Security of tenure was mentioned to us by Shelter early on, but the bill was, had progressed through a stage and we did discuss that and that is why we set up the review group to look at tenancy regime in the private sector. Now that tenancy regime group is not a talking shop. That group consists of a 
variety of stakeholders, 19 um, the Chair Douglas Robertson and 18 other stakeholders made up from landlord associations, letting associations, Chartered Institute of Housing, Council of Scottish Local Authorities, Council of Mortgage <coughs> Lenders, Scottish Poverty Federation, Shelter Scotland. These are Homeless Action Scotland, Edinburgh Private Tenants Action Group. That group came together to discuss tenancy regime and I have said today that we will take forward their recommendation and we will be consulting on that in the autumn and as part of that we will be looking at rent levels. And I will say a bit about this because it was mentioned by Alex Rowley as well and uh, Mary Fee talking about the, the, the capping of the, the rent levels. What I would say that Absolutely, we are keeping rent levels under review. We are aware that in parts of Scotland, in particular Aberdeen, that, that re rising rents are an issue. But it, it, I will repeat, it's important to be clear about the nature and the scale of the problem and what the op options are for addressing it so that we can be sure that any action we take has a positive outcome and avoids any unintended consequences. And I stand by that. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation reported recently that households in Scotland spend a smaller share of their income in housing costs than in England. And the same report also found that poverty rates in Scotland are also lower than they are in England across all housing tenures. However, the Scottish Government is not complacent about this matter and that is why we continue to support, uh, support affordable rents, mid-market rents and work with the house building industry to, inc to increase institutional investment to build new, ho new homes for private rent. And I think that is the right way to take on something of the magnitude that James Kelly is suggesting. I think the right way is to consult with the stakeholders, take evidence from the stakeholders, work up proposals and bring them through the full scrutiny of this Parliament. And that is what we intend to do and that is the right way to do it and not parachute in at stage two uh, of the bill when it wasn't part of the bill initially. And actually what James Kelly was doing, if we tried to do it, give more powers to Scottish ministers, um, he would be absolutely uh, criticising us for that. So I, I find it strange that we've been criticised for following due process and something is important. And importance is getting it right and getting it right for all the tenants across Scotland. And Patrick Harvey was absolutely right. It is about people and it is about their homes. And yes, there's a lot of political toing and froing goes on in among it. But within all that, we are, as a government, committed to housing and improving the housing stock and also uh, in increasing the housing supply. And OK, we've, talked, we've heard from opposition members about banding, about, about figures to use ourselves, but we can't get away from the facts. This administration has built more houses for social rent and for uh, registered social landlord and council houses than previous administrations in Scotland. Even during, and during, during a recession, we are still more private houses for private sale getting built per head of population in Scotland than there is in England and Wales. So that, that's a fact. But we, want, we are in, we're working to increase that supply. We know we need to increase the supply and that's what we're working to achieving. And we're doing that with our stakeholders across the sector. We've got help to buy in Scotland. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Would you still accept, though, that uh, social rented completion uh, houses are all uh, all time uh, lifetime low? Minister. No, I think, um, I think uh, if I say we're building more than we are in previous administrations, then it's not a lifetime low. Um, we are building social houses. And I would also uh, take the point that Alec Rowley made that, that councils are now building souls, uh, houses, council houses, and we very much appreciate the, the contact we have with our stakeholders and the way councils and RSLs have got together to, to help with building the houses. But with a part of that is due to the fact that we abolished the right to buy for new supply in 2010, which allowed local authorities to continue uh, building and start building council houses again and giving them the confidence to do it. So I think, and Maureen Watt used the words, this is a landmark bill, and I think it is for a number of ways not just in what we're doing in right to buy and what we're doing in right to buy is the right thing to do and it's the right time to do it now. 
We are supporting many other schemes to encourage people and help people onto the housing ladder, and we will continue to do that. But Right to Buy has seen its day in Scotland, and we are taking the right action in that. And I think all of the Chamber are supporting us in that, except, of course, for the Conservatives, and that doesn't surprise me. But also this bill introduces other landmark things, first things, private... Um, the, 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 the tribunals for the private rented sector to ensure that there's fair and easy access to justice in the private sector. That's something that I think is new. It's a landmark. It's something that we've been asked to do for some time and we've worked this up. And I think that's an important thing and tenants will very much uh, appreciate that. Also, the regulation of the letting agents. And it was good to get the support of the letting agent industry and the landlords uh, organisations for this. And we got that because we worked with them and we worked together. We listened to what they had to say. We took on board some of what they had to say. But we made it absolutely clear at the outset that we intended to regulate and that reg regulating would have teeth. And that's what we will do. And when we're working up the code of guidance, our view on that will not change. The regulator, the, the private sector will have teeth. And they they welcome that as well because they don't want. Can you bring um, your remarks to a close, Minister? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't realise that. So, finally, Presiding Officer, what I would say is that I would ask the members to support this bill. It is something, and to um, support, move my amendment debate, and support this bill as we take this forward. I think what we've done today is something that we should all be proud of in this chamber. We've got there working together, and I hope that continues. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> that concludes the debate on the House of Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10442 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10442. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10442, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of seven Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 10443 to 10448 on approval of SSIs on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Motion number 10449 on designation of a lead committee. And the question on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 10438, in the name of Margaret Burgess, on the Housing Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Member Strickasser votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10438 in the name of Margaret Burgess is as follows. Yes, 93. No, 12. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to and the House and Scotland Bill is passed. I now propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 10443 to 10448 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. Nobody has objected, so the next question is that motions number 10443 to 10448 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10449, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on designation of a lead committee, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.